Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all here. I'm Hafsa Mazhar. I'm leading resource and support hub program in Pakistan. Today we are in safeguarding South Asia launch event. As in development and humanitarian actor, we all know that in our sector, there is a zero tolerance policy for sexual harassment and abuse and exploitation. And, and we all agree on that, that in humanitarian, whether we are humanitarian worker, whether we are development workers associated with any local NGO, UN organization or any other network. We all agree that the sexual safeguarding is a right of a worker in an organization. And it is also right of us of all the service receivers and the communities we work with them and delivering during development and humanitarian assistance. Safeguarding means preventing harm to people and the environment in the delivery of development and humanitarian assistance. To do this, the organizations need to much, much more focus on responding to the issues regarding the sexual exploitation, abuse, or harassment arise in their organization or during their work, and any issue happened because of the organization's interaction with the communities. Today, we'll take you to the Pakistan Hub launching event to highlight a unique services offered by the Resource and Support Hub. Resource and Support Hub is a program that aims to support organizations in the aid sector to strengthen their safeguarding policies, practices against sexual harassment, abuse, and sexual exploitation. Resource and Support Hub, working with the organizations, especially who are less resourced, and they need, they need assistance, to develop their local uh, policies, especially in the developing countries. RSH is funded by UK aid and the UK government foreign and commonwealth office to help organizations around the world. And is actually, uh, RSH is a consortium and a part of a consortium led by the option with the social development direct as the technical and delivery lead including the International Council of Voluntary Agencies, Teredas Home and Site Saver, plus Clear Global. Let's have a look at agenda now. So um, let's have the, we will start with um, the opening remarks that is delivered by the NGO Dalglish, Acting High Commissioner, British High Commission, Islamabad. Then we will move to Resource and Support Hub team leader, Ms. Emma Wokpo. And following that, we will move to hear uh, Pakistan country assessment findings with me. Then next session, we will go going and having, uh, uh, to, we are going to invite our next panelist, Ms. Fozia Vakar. She's working in federal ombudsperson and have, have a background, wealth of experience and background in development sector. After that, we will move to, um, next session, that is an interactive session and reflection from the audience. This session facilitated by Ms. Asma Saleem, working as a deputy representative ECWA, and she is also facilitating communication of RSH. After that, we will move to uh, have a virtual tour of our of resource and support hub website. And this session facilitated by Ms. Esther Prakas. She is working as communication and content manager, content delivery manager with RSH. Then the last session will be chaired by Ms. Vajdan uh, Jara. She is our uh, global delivery manager, and we will also request uh, and have a detailed session on QA. Uh, and after that, we will close the session. Now, moving on, that I am going to invite our first speaker of the event. So, Mr. Andrew Delgish, who is working as an acting British High Commissioner in Pakistan. So now I'm giving 
session uh, to Mr. Andrew. So, Mr. Andrew, over to you now. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, uh, everybody. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here um, today for the virtual launch of the FCDO funded Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub Pakistan Strategy. It's great to see attendance online. Thank you to everybody um, for being here. And it speaks about the importance of this much needed initiative. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that citizens and beneficiaries are of course at the heart of the work that we do. Protecting their interests and well-being is and will always be our top priority. In FCDO funded programs, we work with some of the most vulnerable communities and individuals who unfortunately are simply not aware very often of their basic rights. And that places them at risk of exploitation and abuse. It's therefore our collective and fundamental responsibility to ensure that we do everything we can to protect them. We live and breathe by the principle of do no harm. We have championed safeguarding and pioneered policies and standards in our programmes and beyond. The UK's strategy on safeguarding against sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, which we call SEAH, in the aid sector was launched in September 2020. The strategy lays out what the FCD, FCDO will do to improve safeguarding standards internally, but also in partner organisations and across the whole international aid sector. Specifically, we have made safeguarding an integral part of our due diligence processes and jointly agreed with our 14 bilateral partners standard commitments in all of our agreements with the United Nations. It's in that context that we are also supporting innovative programs like the Resource and Support Hub to support organizations in strengthening their safeguarding policies and practices against SEAH, as well as in investing in improving mechanisms to support victims. Through the AWAS program, we're working directly with communities and service providers to combat gender-based violence and harassment. We're also supporting Pakistani authorities to develop a sex offender register and management procedures. This will help create safer communities and allow law enforcement agencies to manage better the risk posed to vulnerable citizens by the most dangerous offenders. We're exploring avenues with the UN's Pakistan coordinator on preventing SEAH to strengthen coordination across the aid sector for oper operationalization of SEAH policies in Pakistan. Since the 2018 Haiti scandal, where allegations of sexual exploitation of beneficiaries by humanitarian aid workers first surfaced, multiple instances of abuse across the world have been reported. There is limited data, however, on sexual exploitation and abuse, and we assume high levels of under-reporting. The UN reported 387 allegations of SEAH perpetrated by UN peacekeepers and civilian staff in 2020. We have come to realize that this is just the tip of the iceberg and the actual scale of the problem is much larger. The context in Pakistan is difficult, where there are multiple cultural and legal barriers that discourage survivors from coming forward and reporting. Pakistan continues to witness multiple economic, political and humanitarian crises, which further increase the risk and exposure of vulnerable communities to sexual exploitation and abuse. The country assessment report that we supported through the resource and support hub revealed that while Pakistan has numerous pro-women and child protection laws, implementation remains the biggest challenge. Pakistan ranks 145 on the gender gap index. A lack of funding and an absence of adequate grievance and redress mechanisms is another common challenge. 
to address these challenges, there is a need to develop capacity of local actors, especially those that work directly with vulnerable communities. I believe that the work we're doing to support the RSH Pakistan strategy will directly address these gaps and hopefully serve as stepping stones for the wider development community. We have seen some fantastic stories of change emerging from the Africa and Middle East and North Africa regions, where the RSH national hubs have introduced innovative mentorship and peer-to-peer -peer learning programs, besides providing access to online tools and resources. These initiatives have allowed small, less resourced civil society organizations to learn and embed international safeguarding standards and practices within their organizational culture and procedures. With the right people and support from the wider development community, I'm sure that we will see similar gains in Pakistan. So let's continue our efforts to make Pakistan a safer place for all women, children, and other marginalized groups. And with that, I would like to hand over to the RSH team. I look forward to hearing from our speakers, including Fozia Vikar, the federal ombudsperson, who amongst her other responsibilities, is spearheading the government of Pakistan's SEH agenda. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Andrew Delglish. Thank you so very much for joining us. And you rightly said that with the right people and help, we can build a safer place and address the issue of sexual exploitation, harassment, and abuse. Thank you so much. So moving on that, I'm going to invite our next panelist. Our next panelist is Emma Wokpo. She is team leader of resource and support hub. She is going to share more information about resource and support hub program across the globe and uh, the, the resources and the key achievement we have made until now. So now I'm going to hand over session to Emma. So Emma, over to you now. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Hafsa, and thanks very much, Andrew, for, for joining us and sharing some of your insights um, on, on safeguarding and some of the, the challenges that are facing um, organizations in Pakistan. Um, really lovely to be here and great to see such a huge um, turnout. I hope that this is the start of a, a long engagement with some of the organizations um, who have joined us today and others who are able to um, maybe watch back or engage with the resource and support hub um, throughout our journey in Pakistan. Um, so as Hafsa said, my name is Emma Wokabu. I am the global team leader of the resource and support hub. Um, I am based in the UK. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, we have hubs um, in four regions, um, which cover Africa, Middle East and North Africa. Eastern Europe and also South Asia in, in Pakistan and Bangladesh. Um, the Resource and Support Hub was set up in 2020 um, and has tried to work with as many different organisations as possible to understand um, the, the, the enablers, but also the challenges in, in tackling um, a complex issue such as safeguarding um, from different organisations around the world. Um, we're really here to listen to the voices of those who are trying to implement projects and manage overseas funding um, and be able to deliver aid as safely as possible. Um, we provide free and accessible resources um, for organisations. Um, we will be translating a lot into Urdu um, and really looking at kind of the Pakistani context, the laws and what it means to deliver aid and deliver projects in Pakistan. Um, the Resource and Support Hub will have a team on the ground who is led by Hafsa, um, but we also have our online hub, which you'll hear a little bit later about today. Um, the idea of the Resource and Support Hub is that we are really promoting the voices of organisations. So we're really being as collaborative as possible. We want to work with as many organisations as possible in, in Pakistan um, and really be able to support, um, to support policy and practice and safeguarding 
but also to elevate the voices and share stories of success and of impact. Um, we know that it's really important for organisations to protect their staff and representatives and the community members where they're working. And Andrew already touched on it, but we strive to do no harm um, in terms of engaging with different community members. So it doesn't matter what donor you're funded by or what project you're working on. Um, you know, we really want to collaborate from you and, and hear from you and really work with you and understand you know, what are the challenges and really promote the, the voices and, and promote how to overcome these as much as possible. We'll have a number of activities which we will be running um, over the course of the next few years in Pakistan, and I really hope that everyone will be able to engage in them, um, whether you are a national organisation, an international NGO, or, or whatever your, your status is, um, we hope that we can work together. Um, we recognise that safeguarding policies are vital often to receive funding, um, but we also know that safeguarding goes beyond policy development. And so we really want to work towards having a culture of zero tolerance to inaction on, on safeguarding. Um, we will be addressing um, challenging topics such as leadership and culture. Um, and really looking at you know, the issue of power and how that may change according to um, maybe the organization you're in or, or the setup. So what RSH will be doing is we will have our online hub where we'll have a repository of our resources. We will be working with organizations directly to take them through um, their safeguarding journey because we know, as I said, that safeguarding doesn't stop at policies. It's not just about investigations or case management. There, there really is kind of a wide um, journey that we want to work with organizations on. Um, we will offer direct support to organizations, which we'll be launching today. Um, and re we really want to facilitate dialogue within the sector as well. And um, that, that is kind of why we're here and why we have our, our team on the ground um, in Pakistan. Um, we will also be looking at different pieces of research we know that the culture and the, the context in Pakistan is very unique. Um, and, and we also want to make sure that all of our resources are, are relevant for, for those who um, will be using them. So really the, the key messages um, from my side are that it's really nice to be here. It's really nice to, to launch in Pakistan. Um, and we have done a lot of work behind this launch. Um, so a huge thanks to everyone who has been involved in that. Um, we are here to promote other initiatives as well as RSH materials. Um, we're here to work with the, the PSEA network, with INGOs, with, with um, civil society organisations. So I would really encourage you to reach out um, in whatever way is best for you and to stay in touch with us. Um, we're here to kind of help you and you know, provide any enablers we can. Um, and I hope that you will um, find it useful and we always welcome feedback on the Resource and Support Hub to improve our, our service. So thank you very much, um, Hafsa. I will hand back over to you and look forward to hearing um, the following sessions. Thank you so much, Emma. It's great to listen to you. And thank you for sharing the RSH work and growth in the context. Now we are uh, moving on to the next session and I'm going to share the Pakistan country assessment key findings with you all. Regarding the country assessment, the country assessment actually providing us an analytical overview. Uh, so what is, the, uh, what is the situation of safeguarding and the landscape of safeguarding at the moment in Pakistan? So the purpose of this country assessment to get informed and coming up with the design so that to operationalize our resource and support hub in Pakistan. It provides us a detail on the national context, as well as it also informs us about the key stakeholders, initiatives, and the resources that already exist in the sector to address sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment issues. It also identified the strengths and the gaps and the needs and recommendations in the prioritizing the uh, prioritizing the Pakistan resource and support hub to work. So moving on that, I'm going to share the key methodology. Uh, the, in, uh, the country assessment actually based on the mixed method approach. And we actually started with the desk review. After the desk review, the online survey complemented the information 
according to that, we also have some key information interviews with the key informants. We also involve and have consultations with the stakeholders to get their opinion. And it was also verified and some more information collected through the focus group service. So this is the whole process for the country assessment. Now coming towards the country assessments key finding, uh, which is uh, which is actually highlighting the, uh, the underlying structural inequalities. And it also reflects that the harmful social norms and the power imbalance and power and privileges in relation to the intersectionality community inequalities, it is also, you know, uh, contributing in raising sexual exploitation and abuse issues. It was also said and highlighted during the country assessment that the safeguarding and the protection from sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment is relatively a new concept. So safeguarding is relatively a new concept and there are very less and few specific laws are available, but these laws are still facing challenges in implementation. So, uh, so uh, the country assessment findings also told us that the donors and the partners often don't provide enough un unrestricted funds for the implementation uh, and build safe culture in the organization. This is also a big hurdle that the developing and implementing organizations uh, have less policies, and they are also facing challenge to develop procedures and the code of conduct and safeguarding persons to appoint and have there in their organization where the civil society organization need more support. Uh, sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment complaint mechanisms are difficult to take forward. And you know, the complaints are really complicated in our legal system to address and even to highlight at a, at a very uh, early stage. And it is also needed to encourage uh, more complaints to come up. Then it is also reflected in the country assessment that the CSOs uh, who are working in development and humanitarian setting, they are unable to provide the capacity building facilities to their staff members due to the lack of resources. And they have limitations and they have less uh, knowledge available in the sector on safeguarding. So this is also a big challenge. So uh, can we switch the site? Can we go to the next slide? It is also, uh, uh, the study also reflects that the lack of accessible and easy to understand resources that is contextualized and easy for the audience to understand are not available or less lessly available. In addition to this, the available material don't represent at many stages the most vulnerable groups like person with the disabilities, transgender persons, and often the women and the girls, uh, especially. There is a big lack of specialized uh, expertise on safeguarding and protection in the sector, and it is difficult to retain these staff members and individuals in an organization. It is also uh, visible through the study that the lack of trained professionals or the non-government or with the civil society organizations and the non-government organizations who can provide the psychosocial support to the victims and the survivors and there is a lack of training on gender-based violence referral mechanisms to set up and to operationalize. It was also said by the stakeholders uh, in the study that this is a big challenge that the organizational leadership not buy in very easily to build the uh, safeguarding culture. And this is really uh, critical because it is most important thing, but it reflects that. So in Pakistan, it was also observed during the study while we were collecting uh, some information. It was also seen that the PSCA network operationalized only in an emergency situation. And after that, it goes, uh, you know, um, on a different, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it goes down. Uh, but in, in the recent fact, it is actively working and they are also launching some of their you know, chapters in different provinces. And uh, it was also seen that we need to improve and encourage more organizations representation in the network that is uh, less at the moment. So coming to the next uh, slide. So there are key recommendations we collected from the study that we provided us base to set up our priorities for resource and support hub. So resource and support hub 
actually can play a catalytic role and can support less resource organizations to strengthen their safeguarding capacity by ensuring that the safeguarding policies are in place and they are, that they are working with the safeguarding approach based on the local context. So RSH must support the key stakeholders in the humanitarian and development sector so that they can develop their policies. According to that, they also need to develop their procedures related to handle safeguarding issues involving in their organization, with the Swami Sani government organizations and the networks, and we need to engage with them more. Resource and support hub also need to work on awareness raising and contextualization of global safeguarding standards and bringing them in the local context so that the people can you know, access it, not only access it, but also you know, understand it properly. And we will do that through the dialogue and building partnership on safety. Resource and support hub can play a catalytic role to ensure the safeguarding is fully understood, embedded into the sector, and it is, and we are here to facilitate. So these are the key recommendations we got, and after, based on the key recommendation, we set the Pakistan strategic themes. So the basic strategic theme we selected are safeguarding in the context, culture, leadership, governance, and accountability having safe programs, investigation and complaint response mechanism should be strengthened and available, then the disability and influence. So I'm going to explain each strategic theme briefly on uh, in the next slides. So go to the next slide, please. So starting with the safeguarding in context. So what it means to safeguarding in a context that we are going to provide contextualized materials, services, tools in line with the local context to address the root causes of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment in Pakistan. And the impact of uh, the sexual abuse and harassment in emergency situations majorly, and it is also you know, causing to increase the vulnerability of already marginalized groups. It is also important we are going to address the local uh, issues with the local context. Uh, then the key drivers and the barriers to address safeguarding issues and focus on the local best practices that we promote. So uh, coming to the next uh, strategic uh, theme, so culture, leadership, governance, and accountability. What it includes, it includes building policies, developing structures, having processes in place in an organizations, and it is making sure that where the organizations and getting by in and the leadership is ready to introduce safe, safe culture in their organization. And how we will do that? We are going to introduce our mentorship program, which is a flagship program of resource and support hub. And uh, in, in, in mentorship program, we are going to build the capacity of less resource organization to enhance their policies and build their capacity to address the issues, whatever they are facing. And we are also going to have a dialogue platform where we are going to invite representatives, stakeholders, all stakeholders to come together with, with us and uh, less resource CSO's representation is more focused because so that the positive workplace culture has should be built. And we are also promoting to peer experiences and peer learning. Uh, we are also going to raise awareness uh, at, through the awareness sessions and the trainings more so that the culture and the leadership should be, uh, the leadership should get by in. And now we are moving on to the next slide. Safe programming, providing free of charge ask and expert service. You can also, uh, you can also experience the service and avail the service while clicking on our website. Translating and contextualizing tool that is needed to integrate for the safeguarding into the program cycle and to create more safe programs. Investigation and complaint response mechanism, but what are we are going to do in the strategic theme that we are contextualizing, contextualizing some guidelines and guiding notes that will be available and the tip sheets that has been already developed and available on uh, addressing uh, and responding to the uh, sexual harassment and abuse issues. We are going to have more webinars, roundtable discussions on the key topic like response mechanism, how we can strengthen it more. And it is 
uh, going to help the organization. Then we are going to mobilize regional and local experts to become a part of the resource and support hub consultant directories. And these directories will be available for the, uh, look, uh, for the wider audience to get support from. Disability and inclusion, this is our uh, key theme, and uh, this is cross-cutting theme, but contextualizing disability, inclusive, safe program, having inclusive tools and guidelines, that is our key mandate. Then the working with the CSOs, with the disability, who is actually working on work with disabled people to understand their issues more and, and work with them. So we are working with them. Uh, so, so this is it from the strategic themes. Now we are going to the next slide. Let's have a look at uh, or our approach. So what is our approach? So the safeguarding resource and support hub is less resource, working with the less resource CSOs and focusing on that. So gender inclusion and gender and inclusion are a key approach because we we are you know addressing the gender challenges and also we are not leaving anyone behind. So inclusive approach is more more of our agenda. The implementation approach is based on the evidence from the country assessment and user survey. And we are also going to, uh, to serve providing service tailored services that require contextualizing material, translated and the blended materials as well. Uh, a, a strategic advice provided by the National Expert Board. We are also going to develop a National Expert Board based on the uh, sector's key experts who are going to advise us more on building safeguarding resources and contextualizing and adapting. Partnership and collaborations are the uh, key of our work. So we are going to invite wider sector um, uh, actors so that they can come and join hand with us. Program delivery is mostly remotely with the limited in-person interaction, but this resource and support hub is available online for the support. So going to the next slide, let's have a look on progress so far, what we have done until now. The country assessment has been successfully completed. A validation number of validation workshops help to collect the sector's uh, Key, you know, uh, key approach and recommendations. Then the summary is available on our website. Uh, the country assessment summary is also available in Urdu, and you can also reach to them. And if you need uh, the detailed country assessment report, you can request for that to me. Thank you. Started uh, contextualization and translation range of resources on safeguarding, including the free resource and support hub online e-learning course that is available, Safeguarding Matters. The module one is already uploaded in Urdu language and that is available. Then we also additionally developed flood materials that is also available in Urdu language and you can easily access that. We are also, we already started uh, engagement with the key stakeholders, consortium partners and networks more. PSCA network is also going to, we are also going to collaborate with them as well. Gender-based uh, violence subsector is also in a reach and the GBV clusters and the in, with the national level, we are also in touch with them. We, are, we have already formed the National Expert Board that is very soon going to you know, build uh, the resources that will be needed uh, in Pakistan. So coming, um, that's it for the progress now. And look at, let's have a look at sustainability and impact of the resource and support. Hub. So the resource or support hub, as I shared that, can play a catalytic role and complement the existing available resources and services and the efforts the other actors are doing in the humanitarian and development sector. So this is our role to you know, leverage on that. We invest in the local capacity and adopt a localized approach to service delivery. Local CSOs are center of our services. We focus on changing organizational culture because it is important to have safe culture for the safety of the uh, for the safety of uh, uh, the staff and the program they deliver so the main mainstreaming of safeguarding and targeting the organizational governance around safeguarding is more important and we will focus on that in in the sustainable uh, sustainable way in managed local processes we will develop national affiliates will be selected through the ownership of the national hub 
and it will be uh, will be responsible to take forward all the work that will be done and full operationalize offering ongoing sustainable locally relevant capacity building activities for CSO and they will continue that. Can we go to the next slide, please? We offer a common initiatives on safeguarding, and uh, we are actually uh, working with the donors and the funders and the different thematic priority groups to unite them, them uh, to unite them, and uh, bringing them together to address the risk of safeguarding. We encourage peer learning, and for that, we are also going to build community of practice. That is the best way to gather uh, in, to provide a platform where the organization can come together and share their learnings with each other. And in this way, we facilitate peer learning. And, uh, and we are also building community of practices with the different regions as well, so that we can adopt best practices from the other regions as well. And this work will continue. So can we go to the next slide? This is it from the country assessment, uh, but you can stay in touch with us. You can sign up our newsletter, which is available in different languages, English, Urdu, Bangla, Arabic, French, and Sawahi. And please follow us on the social media network. We are available on LinkedIn. You can also reach us on Twitter as well, and you can also reach us on Facebook. And for any question and queries, please don't hesitate to write to me directly. I'm available to facilitate you can you can check my email address here and in chat box also so i'm hafsa mazar you can uh, reach to me for any question and queries later on and we can have separate discussions thank you very much so moving on to that we are actually going to have a quick session with uh, with you and for this session we are going to have an interactive session with you all and for the interactive session, we can invite our uh, communication expert, Ms. Asma Salim. And I'm going to hand over session to Ms. Asma so that she can run a quick interactive session with us. So Asma, over to you now. Thank you so very much, Hausa. Um, hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure meeting you all here. I can see that uh, we have got a big number and participation is amazing. I can see a lot of introduction in the chat box. I think this is amazing to see that and definitely we will be in touch with you through our research. Um, you have Hafsa Mazhar email ID as well and definitely we will make sure that you will have her access as well before we um, close this uh, webinar. Um, so for this session, I will be leading an uh, interactive session with you using a Mentimeter. So in just in case, if you are unfamiliar with this uh, tool, uh, it is basically, um, you can open it on your web browser, uh, which is called Mentimeter. I just posted the direct link and also website as well, and also the code. I will just about to share my screen too. Just hold on a second. Yes, so I am just sharing my screen. Okay. So you can imagine the last minute things happen. I cannot see my screen anymore. Sorry about that. So um, as I am sharing my screen, I would like to hear from you. Um, of course, we will be using um, um, this um, a Mentimeter, but definitely would like to hear from you as well that what do you think about um, um, safeguarding and how do you feel about this um, assessment? If you have any queries, if you have any comments, you can easily chat up, put this into the chat box as well. We have Q&A session, Q&A uh, chat box open as well. You can easily write down as well. Our team is also watching your questions and we are, uh, our team behind the scenes are working on that as well. So if somebody Somebody can point it out if you can see my screen. Uh, yes, Asma, we can see your screen. Thank you. That's perfect. So I'm just going to put this on the presenter mode. So you can see on the left side, um, there's the code bar as well. So if somebody is using their mobile phone or they have QR code, they can scan this code as well. And you can directly go to, into the Mentimeter. And you can see that there is menti.com as well. You can easily write down the code, which is 71435314. And this is the code you get you into directly into the room. I can see there are 29 people already in the room. 
I will wait for a few mi more minutes uh, for people to join us. And if you have any difficulty joining us, no problem. You can also answer your uh, feedback um, or your reaction to us into the chat box. And I can see that some of the people are writing down. That's great. So our first question is, what is safeguarding? Uh, while you're answering, just for you to know that this is going to be a cloud word and you have 25 characters as well, you can write down as many as words you can to describe safeguarding, what is mean to you and what is mean in your context. All right, Safe, uh, safety, preventing harm, do no harm, excellent. Um, I can see there are 50 people join us, that's great. Uh, protection, survival centered, all right, that's a good one as well. Okay, PSCA. Yeah, anyone would like to put uh, uh, add a um, PSCA as an acronym in the chat box? If somebody does not know about that, that would be great. Child protection, I can see. Wow, protection, do no harm again. Yes. Transparency, capacity, good space, mindfulness, policy. All right, that's a good one as well. I'm gonna put more a uh, couple of seconds more for that. Risk management. All right. Yeah. I can see protection, safeguarding, do no harm is the key words coming out into the word cloud. PSE again. Yeah. Preventing harm. Anything special, mitigation measures, yes, culture, resource. What do you mean by resourced? I would like to hear about, about what do you mean by resourced? If you can put a more complete answer on in the chat, chat box, we would love to hear from you. Justice, I see justice as well, security, clear processes, prevention, quality, yes. All right. So I think the trends that are coming into this word clause is again, do no harm, safe, safety, preventing harm, preventing from harm, protection from abuse. That's great. So I think we can move toward the next slide. So on your screen, um, as I will be sharing my uh, next slide, you will also have to click on your um, window as well. So we are moving toward the next one. And I think maybe perhaps I can give a couple of more uh, uh, seconds as well, because I can see 99 answer has been here. There are people still joining. But I think this trend is the same. I see that somebody put protection policies. That's a good one as well. Duty of care, excellent. Risk management. Yeah, I can see that people are already aware of what safeguarding is actually mean and what we are actually talking about here. That sounds great. So yes, I am now moving forward to the next slide. Oh, that's amazing. We have got 109 answers and some of, there are, some of them are really unique. Perfect. So now I'm moving toward the next slide now. Yes. So the next slide is, what are the key safeguarding risks in your context? So for that, um, you have an open-ended question. You have 140, 140 characters to write down and we have open multiple entries as well if you would like to share more and you think your answer couldn't be in the Mentimeter, you can also put that in the chat box as well. We will look right after uh, using a Mentimeter. Okay, so now I'm going to enter and see the answers. Uh -huh. What are the key risks in your context biases? Lack of awareness of safeguarding. You became alienated at the workplace. That is very interesting. If somebody would um, explain that in the chat box, would definitely love to hear what does, what does that mean? Low reporting. Ensuring confidentiality, of course, that's da data protection, protection of the beneficiaries, of course, a big, big risk. Unsafe recruitment, protection, uh, child protection, sexual abuse, of course, data security, again, important one. 
predators, protection of children and women in our care, societal, cultural barrier to reporting is the biggest threat to effective implementation of safeguarding mechanism, excellent social norms, power imbalance, of course, lack of data, system, uh, system uh, systemic discrimination. Yes, and if somebody would like to explain that, that would be really great in the chat box. Would definitely love to hear what that does mean to you and how we can uh, kind of, you know, but that would be the next question. So yeah, that's good one. Lack of knowledge, of course, no reporting mechanism available in the sexual harassment at workplace. I think this is one of the biggest risks, definitely. And this is something which we have also seen uh, during the validation workshop we have done it last year in different provinces. No responsiveness of relevant institution, of course. That is something which Andrew just pointed out in the beginning as well. Sexual harassment of staff, yes, of course, that is again a big thing. Abuse, neglect, exploitation, radicalization, online safety, mental health concerns. I think you have pointed out a lot of risk here. Poverty, culture of science, mm -hmm. sincerity. Sorry, I am not understanding what you write, but I think we get the point. And awareness, code of conduct limited legal aid services of course i think that is again very big um concern as well lack of resources and i will read something which is coming unique as a risk as well conflict of interest interesting misogyny power imbalance again we have got 86 answers and still coming that's great social norms, power dynamics, a lack of reporting, pre-existing harmful cultural norm. I think, yes, I think this is, again, one of the biggest risks as well. Whatever pre-existing pre biasness and norms we have set, not in the workplace only, but also um, at the uh, uh, as a cultural as a culture as well, I think this is an extremely important one to address as a risk. Poor legal system. Screening of volunteers, yes, I think that is again very important one. When especially when you are in the uh, response mode, leadership not prioritizing safeguarding. I guess I think this is again one of the thing. Have um, I remember when we were doing a validation workshop? This is again one of the thing come out as um as one of the uh, priority one. Leadership is not prioritizing. I think that is a biggest risk as well for the organization. Limited aid services again. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. All right, That's, that is amazing. We are just keep on receiving um, answers. And I think we will have a few more um, seconds and then we will move to the next question. Fear of stigma. I think this is again, something related to the mindset and also what, is, uh, what has been prevailing so far in our context. Denial of management about accepting the CEA. Oh my God, yeah. This is again something related to the organization. Oh, misuse of religion. Of course, that is again something which is, of course, controversial and a big um, in our context as well. Taboos, of course, helpline using as a tool to harass staff. Again, yes, it's, this is one of the tool of um, harassing people, but yeah. So I think we have got enough uh, responses. So I think just looking at the time as well, let's move on to the next slide. And uh, yes, so wow, some of the people already went there. That's great. So in your opinion, what are the major organizations should put in place to prevent response uh, and respond to safeguarding concerns? So it could be uh, something which is happening in your uh, organization. Feel free to put um, post it here. And something which you think should be a part of um, organizational policy and measures should be in place in organization. Definitely would love to hear from you. And I am just opening the answers now. We are receiving a lot. Wow, you guys are really expert in Menti. Wow. Okay, great. Easily accessible reporting channels. 
that's that's a good one because I can see now it's totally related to the risk that we just um, we just saw uh, people posted. There are a couple of measures uh, in the organization as well. Um, easy accessible reporting channels, complaint response and reporting system. All right, safeguarding suit of policies, recruitment, disciplinary policies, training, risk assessment, services, due diligence, in agreement partnership and activities. Wow. That's great to know. There are different techniques techniques to put in place feedback and complaint mechanisms. Code should be clear, easy to understand for beneficiaries in local language. Amazing operational agreements should also be covered. Should keep an eye on female staff reporting to male staff where the exploitation is reflected in job performance. All right. Okay, let's move on to, oh, wow, we have received 80 answers. I'm just looking at the time and I might not read all of the responses now. I might pick some of the one. All right, uh, we have received one response, awareness, uh, raise awareness to staff, projects, participants, training put in place, report mechanism, raise awareness again. Yes, of course, I think that is one of the key aspects. And uh, if you come to our website, um, RSS South Asia, you can see that there are many, many information available as well for uh, staff. And we have put in place some of the training material as well, uh, learning, uh, different learning modules as well for the people who would like to increase their knowledge, um, not for themselves only, of course, but for the organization as well, because this is something which is, um, if may, uh, safeguarding is mainstream in your organization, that means that it has a strong effect um, in terms of implementation. Safeguarding mechanism dissemination, what is interesting, educational promotion, protection policy, of course, safe recruit recruitment is essential. I think this is again very, very important point um, uh, for the screening of uh, new um, employer employees. Having a safeguarding policy, of course, that's I think the base uh, basics of what we are discussing so far, uh, organizational wide safeguarding risk assessment. I think this is a very extreme, extremely important one. And I think my colleague, Esther, she will be also sharing with you the tool we have developed under the RSH. That would be very helpful as well. And it's easily and free available, uh, freely available in our website as well. And... Uh, Focal, uh, focal points of um, safeguarding. I think, yes, that's important as well if you have a person in place. Change of behavior, of course, but uh, that is something which is, um, of course, it's a systematic change as well if we really want mindset change and behavior change. Uh, reporting mechanism that are trusted and safe, excellent point. CRM again, that's great. Trainings, yes, of course, capacity strengthening, having the understanding of safeguarding and all the principles and, you know, what what are kind of, what are the types of um, um, abuses, you know, um, all the things. I think that's very important as well to know and also to have the remedy as well. Dedicated staff, yes. Solid HR policies, of course, policies, again, a very important one as well. Uh huh. I am just scrolling down to see any unique response. Feedback, of course, I think feedback is again very important as well to ensure that the policy that we have placed has effectiveness as well. I think still we are getting responses. I think, uh, thank you so very much uh, everyone for your responsive and being so responsive here. I think I can just stop uh, sharing now my screen as well and see in the chat box if we have received any more comments and any other feedback from the colleagues. Yes, I can read it out some of the one for you. Um, hmm. There is one it includes psychological, emotional, physical, sexual, financial, and even spiritual risk for personal belief system. I'm not sure, Lala, what you have said in what context, but I think that is something which of course, it's very much relevant as well when we talk about safeguarding. All right, I can see uh, awareness reporting, responding, mechanism, capacity building. Of course, this is what just we have seen 
in the Mentimeter. Yes. So now I can see my time is about to up. Thank you so very much for all the participation. I think that was amazing. Uh, definitely, we will be uh, recording uh, your, all your responses and put in place uh, with the uh, program team as well to make sure it will be highlighted in our, um, um, in our discussions moving forward with the Pakistan Hub. Um, with that, I will hand over back to Hafsa. Thank you so much, Hafsa, for having me here. Over to you. Thank you all. Thank you, Asma, uh, and thank you, everyone. I want to thank you for uh, very quick responses in this session, and it really went very well with all of you. Uh, so moving on that, we are going towards our, our virtual tour. Uh, and for that, I'm going to request Ms. Esther Prakas. She is working as a digital communication and content manager with RSH, and she is taking us on a virtual tour of Resource and Support Hub Pakistan. So over to you now, Esther. Thank you so much, Hafsa. Hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. It's really nice to, to see so much activity here uh, in Manti. Thank you, Asma, for the great uh, activity here. And also thank you all for, for putting your responses into the chat. Um, I have seen a, a question actually about uh, the recording of this uh, launch. Uh, we are recording uh, this event, so both the English and the Udu versions will be available on our website. So uh, in the next few minutes, I will uh, highlight a few important resources and services available on the Safeguarding Resource and Support Hubs uh, uh, platforms. And I would like to take some time to just take you through a little bit of the global RSH website. RSH is the the short form that we use to, to designate the, the project. And uh, then I will also uh, go to specifics of the South Asia platform. Uh, in a few minutes, I would like to share a video that basically uh, showcases the vision and mission of the RSH, as well as the most important uh, resources and services. And then after that, I will go through uh, some of the, the most important uh, menu functions so that you in your in your own time will also be able to browse the platform and make the best use of that. So I'm just going to share my screen and uh, we will first uh, watch uh, the video um, that uh, that actually will take us through the um, uh, the RSH uh, global platform. So I hope that you can see uh, my screen and I'm going to start the video now. The Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub or RSH. We are a UK aid funded program that supports organizations to improve their approaches to safeguarding against sexual exploitation, abuse and sexual harassment, SEAH. On the RSH online platform, you'll find a library, an e-learning course, webinars, podcasts, a directory of safeguarding consultants, and more. Our online platform is available in English, Arabic, French, and Swahili. We support all organizations in the humanitarian and development sector, but we prioritize smaller local organizations. Let's take a look at what the Hub has to offer. Welcome to our library. Here, you can browse through hundreds of relevant resources, including our own tip sheets, tools and guidance that are short, practical and easy to use. Search keywords or use our safeguarding journey to find what you need. The safeguarding journey will guide you through four stages of safeguarding. At each stage, you can find selected information and resources that we have chosen to help you every step of the way. Safeguarding Matters is our free e-learning course. It's designed for people who are new to safeguarding or who want to refresh their skills. Take the course online or offline and earn a safeguarding certificate. The modules take around one hour each and are free, interactive and story-based. If you need the support of a safeguarding consultant, you can search our directory by region, 
language and service and find the perfect fit. We also have national hubs that work directly with local organizations in the country. There are hubs in Nigeria, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Jordan, Syria, Yemen, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Each hub has its own online platform with context-specific resources in local languages. They also offer services like mentoring and advice. To keep up to date with our work, sign up for our newsletter and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. Visit safeguardingsupporthub.org Together, we can build a safer sector. So that was the little video that I hope it gave you some insights into what we do. And I will speak specifically about some of the resources that, that were mentioned in the animation, uh, specifically about the e-learning that I think many of us can benefit from, as well as the Ask an Expert service and more. Uh, so I will then uh, again share my screen, just so we can go into uh, a little more detail uh, about the specific uh, services and resource resources that are accessible on the website. So I will just first go to the global um, to the global RSH hub. Uh, some of you may actually access the South Asia hub from the global website. And again, I'm going to share my screen, and I hope you can see it. So this is the, the global hub where this animation that we just watched is accessible. And uh, as you scroll down, you'll be able to access a, a search function that basically allows you to search our immense resource library that's, that also have some mentioned, where we have lots of tip sheets, templates, uh, other resources that you can search. Uh, as you scroll down some more, you'll be able to uh, go to the specific regional and local hubs. And we usually also highlight some of the most important resources, for example, the PSA glossary that's uh, an effort uh, that our consortium also participated in. And you can also access our online learning course from here, the safeguarding journey learning tool, as well as webinars and podcasts. So I will speak more specifically about the safeguarding essentials. This is one of our flagship resources. A very useful tool. But first, let me just click through to the South Asia Hub, uh, which you also can access directly if you type in southasia.safeguardingsupporthub.org. And just a note here, I will put um, specific links into the chat after my presentation so that you can access some of these resources uh, quite easily. So I would like to point out that actually now, if you navigate to the top left corner of the platform, you'll see Urdu here. So if you click on this menu item, the entire South Asia hub will appear to you in Urdu and you can navigate through the menu uh, in, in this language. We will keep adding uh, contextualized and translated resources in Urdu and Bangla as well. So it's worthwhile checking back from time to time. Uh, unfortunately, I don't read or write in, uh, Urdu, so I just have to switch back now to English so I can guide you through the uh, menu uh, appropriately. Uh, we have seen in the Menti a question about what safeguarding is, and we saw a lot of interesting and, and, and great responses. If you click to what is safeguarding, uh, you'll find definitions here. So it may be worthwhile reading here uh, 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 specific definition about safeguarding and FCAH. And if you scroll down, you'll be able to access the Pakistan Country Assessment Executive Summary. So you can download this here in English. And when you're in the Urdu uh, platform, you can access that in Urdu as well. Uh, I have already briefly mentioned resources. So when we were uh, browsing the, the global platform, we were able to search the entire library, which now has uh, close to 1,000 resources. We have filtered those resources down uh, by relevance for South Asia. So here you can search uh, for tools and resources relevant to your region. So you could put in a keyword, 
And you could also uh, basically put up a, a filter in here. So if you're interested in pulling up blog articles, you can select uh, from the scroll down menu here. You can also just click on documents and reports and you can do a search there. So as I mentioned, uh, we update the, re the resource library frequently. And of course, we let you know about most recent resources through our newsletter as well, which I will come to at the end of the presentation. I wanted to also talk about the safeguarding journey itself. This is another flagship resource of the RSH, and uh, this is an interactive tool. So if you uh, click into any of these quadrants, so basically the safeguarding journey is split into four specific topics. And when you click on one, uh, a map will be pulled up. And this map has further topics here. And these headlines, sort of headers, serve as uh, links that will take you further into pages that uh, collect or summarize resources that are relevant to those specific topics. So in, we invite you to basically browse through here and explore the journey uh, in your own time. As you have seen, uh, there's a ribbon that shows on every page all across the hubs. And this is the safeguarding essentials package. When we click through, we'll be able to basically access another amazing depository of resources that is again uh, split into specific topics. And the main idea behind this package is that there are organizations who are really just starting out uh, on the safeguarding journey. So they may ask, yes, but we have all these amazing resources, but where do we really start? So we have put together uh, a package, a resource package for you, which you can download as one complete pack. So if you were to click on this link, uh, it would download to your computer a zip folder, so a compressed folder with about 15 resources. If you do not want to download the resource pack uh, in one go, you could also just browse through the specific uh, contents here on the left and choose which resources are most important to you. So again, you can browse through prevention, reporting, response, and more. And of course, uh, you can still just go back and then download the pack uh, to, to have it on your computer um, and to use it uh, later on as well. Another really great resource here is our learning tool. So Safeguarding Matters is a five module uh, e-learning course that is available in multiple languages. <laughs> and it is also contextualized. So you will see here on the main page that this interactive and story-based course is actually contextualized uh, for various uh, regions, including MENA and South Asia. So when you access the course from the South Asia hub, you'll be taken uh, directly to the contextualized version. Modules one and two of the contextualized South Asia version are already available in English. And module one is available in Urdu as well as in Bangla. So all you need to do is uh, create an account and then you can log in and complete the modules in your own time. Uh, once you complete the assessment, after a module, you'll also receive a certificate. If you encounter any issues with registering, we have a great tool here, uh, a short tutorial animation that you can also watch with Urdu and Bangla subtitles. And that will explain you in more detail how to register, how to go through the course, complete the assessment. And then at the end, you'll receive, once you pass the assessment, you'll receive a certificate uh, of completion in your mailbox. And uh, direct support. So we have some uh, really amazing services that you can use. For instance, the Ask an Expert service, uh, which is specifically designed uh, for organizations that are, uh, in our case, based and registered in uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh. 
what this uh, service means is that if your organization has a specific safeguarding related concern, you're welcome to write to us uh, or fill a fully confidential web form, which uh, you will find the link of right here in the website. You'll also find the email address here. And of course, I will put these links into our chat later on. And once we receive your request or inquiry, we try to match you up with an expert who will devote three days of their time to find solutions and answers to your question. If you'd like to learn more about the Ask an Expert service, we invite you to watch this brief animation, which you can also uh, put the captions on in, in Urdu and Bangla. So you're welcome to uh, browse more and watch this animation. And there's another service that I'd like to point out briefly. This is the Safeguarding Consultants Directory. And uh, this means that um, we basically have a depository of uh, experts who have gone through a quite intense three-step um, uh, evaluation of quality assurance process. And uh, you can browse them by uh, the langu uh, sorry, languages and also by the regions or countries that they're based in, as well as you'll see their specific expertise. Uh, one thing to note here is that to use uh, the consultants directory to, to actually use the services of these individuals, the RSH does not cover the cost. However, you're welcome to turn to them in case your organization needs more uh, uh, safeguarding support. And then uh, I'll just come to the newsletter. As I mentioned, we have, uh, we constantly update our resources. Uh, we keep producing more materials. So it's um, uh, worthwhile to sign up for our newsletters. Um, if you click through uh, from the South Asia Hub, you'll be taken directly to this form. All you need to do is fill it in and subscribe. At any point, you no longer want to receive our notifications or the, the newsletter, you can unsubscribe with one click. Uh, however, it may be a, a good idea if you'd like to stay in the loop and know about upcoming events, webinars, new resources, which hopefully will include quite soon some uh, more blog posts, podcasts, and more mentorship applications, for example. So uh, we invite you to take the opportunity and sign up to the newsletter. And last but not least, if you go back up to the top left corner of the page, you'll see three icons here, which I'm sure you're familiar with. These take you to our social media channels. So we have presence on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we post resources here in English, Urdu, and Bangla, and other languages as well. So uh, we invite you to follow us here and to also post your questions, comments, maybe ideas for what kind of resources you may like to see more of. Uh, and basically, that was it from me. Uh, as I mentioned, I will just um, quickly put some links into the chat, and then we hope to connect with you through our newsletters, through our social media, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Esther. Thank you so very much for taking us a wonderful virtual tour, and I'm sure that uh, the organization and all the participants are here with us. They have uh, seen the uh, Resource and Support Hub is providing resources and tools for the less resource organization that is readily available for all of uh, for all of them here. So moving on that, I'm going to invite Ms. Vajtantara. She is working as an uh, as a global delivery manager with us. And I'm going to hand over session to Vajtan to take us through the question and answer sessions, and then also going to uh, discuss more about RSA with us. Thank you very much. So over to you, Vajtan, now. We received some questions on the private, some questions in the chat, and we also received some questions from the field from time to time. So please allow me to see to check some papers around me. So um, we received some comments around what are the options to address such issue in a society where the law is enforcement and there is law laws enforcement and there is abusive language and engage and uh, engagement in sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, even in the road. 
So we as a resource support hub realize and we always acknowledge that there is a lot to be done um, from the start of the event, all guests spoke about the law enforcement, the barriers and the challenges now. We do believe that everyone has, is responsible. Resource and Support Hub is a catalyst. It's a convenient space where all actors from civil society organizations, donors and INGOs can come to discuss together within the, their arena on the barriers and how to address. And this should be reflected to the community practices. I think we should start by realizing what are the root causes of the of the of, of sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment, and how can we convene and how can we participate in awareness raising as representatives of uh, local uh, um, local organizations here in this group. We have another question speaks about will the resource and support hub work in complementarity with the uh, CIA network and others or not. So as Hafsa confirmed, we are a catalyst and we work collectively and we are there to complement what others are doing. So we always seek coordination and we check what's on the ground. We check with other existing players and we complement the space. There is another question speaks about how often you will share your updates with us. As Esther said, there is a regular newsletter and you can always subscribe to our newsletter to know what are the upcomings. And uh, can we request, there is a question about, can we request an edit to a tool? Yes, of course. When we upload any tool to the website, to Pakistan page, there will be a space for comments. And we regularly, our online team regularly uh, review all comments and provide feedback. And if there is any need to get back to the uh, people, we just speak to them and align. Please share the Mentimeter responses separately. It may inspire us and help us to make the safeguarding more comprehensive for sure. All presentations and all exercise exercises will be shared with the follow-up email with you. And uh, I want to engage how. It depends on if you are individual, list resource, CSO, donor, INGO, or a network. We all are responsible, and we think that we all can play part of the making sure that the safeguarding, uh, uh, the sector is safeguarded and it's, it's safer. If you are a list resource, CSO, working local or national level, please try to engage with us. How to start, you can start by the online modules, free and certified. And after that, you ask for expert support, you ask for more engagement in dialogue spaces, or you ask for engagement training spaces. I'm a network, I don't implement directly, and I wanna support. Being a network, that means that you are a convenient space and you have number of members. So join our arena to disseminate and amplify voices and invite your members to the online courses, face-to-face -face engagement, even sometimes in contextualization and to support activities. Can we get fund? One of our commonly questions, can we get fund through the resource and support hub? Actually, the resource and support hub is not a donor. However, by building your institutional capacity in safeguarding, that will prove and rise your increase your ability to 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 cross or to pass the due diligence processes with with many donors so yes indirectly this can be considered as part of your realigning policies and part of your due diligence and risk assessment with, with donors we are a cso and we don't have time for long engagements Yes, we realize that some national and big organizations, they don't have too much time to be engaged in longer engagements. That's why we have set of services, customized ones for short term engagements. You can join us from time to time, our roundtables and our webinars, you can join our sessions. And for specified short term services, you can also use our Ask an Expert service call 
there, there is an, a, a video that the team will display now in the chat with the email, contact us and ask for, ask an expert service. It's a short term and it helps you to, uh, to increase your capacity or it answers your questions in a short term. There is an interesting commonly question from even comments, or sometimes we consider it as a frustration and complaint from civil society saying, the problem is not with us. We are aware of the needs, challenges, and try to operate in minimal resources. And uh, we are driven by donor demands. If support is not given, what should we do? Our answer can be divided into two sections to that. In a minimal standards and minimal resources, I think we all are accountable and we should make sure that we have minimum standards to protect our staff and to safeguard, to safeguard staff and uh, contractors and the people who come to communicate with us throughout the implementation process. On the wider perspective, yes, there is a responsibility for INGOs and donors to support list resource CSOs who are long lasting, who are in the, in the front with the community. And that's why part of our activities within the resource and support hub is doing round tables and conversations with donors, INGOs and list resource CSOs to make donors aware of what type of challenges the organizations have to operate and to increase the knowledge among the staff of the list resource sources on how even to engage and how to express challenges and how to advocate on the importance of the safeguarding while negotiating your budget and while negotiating your proposal with the donors. I will pick some questions from here. We have observed children out of school, schools face more physical, psychological, and sexual abuse problems in Pakistan. What safeguarding tools you think? This is the question. So on what can be, what can be provided is if you follow our page, you will find some resources speaking on uh, vulnerability symptoms and how to provide, let's say, support. And uh, Pakistan, how will we work in the coming period on contextualizing some tools related to child safeguarding that you can always open and read. And if you need more support, you just engage with our resource and support hub team in Pakistan for more information or for more support. Another, let's say, commonly question comes from all hubs, and now it's from Pakistan, it speaks about here in Pakistan, the policies for the safeguarding, safeguarding of women at the workplace. Um, but the issue is with the law enforcement. How to implement the policies in this situation? And a CSO is asking this question. I think we always say that we need to start from the root causes and we need to believe that it's not single responsibility lies on single CSO. It's all together, donors, CSOs, community leaders, INGOs and government common partner. We do what we can in our circle. If I'm a CSO, my let's say duty is to make sure that my internal climate and atmosphere is safe. I put my policies, and I correct my practices to make sure that my environment is safe. And after that, I try to engage with the PSIA or the resource and support hub or any dialogue space, convenience spaces to address wider issue with the law enforcement. And again, we at the resource and support hub, we're not implementing policies in Pakistan. We are a convenience space catalyst for everyone to come together to address things from the root causes to the how to operationalize from a global to local level, respecting the culture, respecting the religion, and addressing community needs. And we always say to our uh, stakeholders, we just say from policy to practice. 
if you go to our website, you will find the safeguarding journey. It's four building blocks that Esther talked about the, the uh, website. We start by definitions. Before we address the issue of safeguarding, we need to know, we need to address the definition, how we define safeguarding. From the definition, then we move to risk assessment. What type of risks and how to address risks? And from the risk, we go to the action planning, which is the third building block of the safeguarding journey that we have in our website to speak of implementation. Implementation, just to avoid speaking on policies, it's started from the policy, but it trickled down to HR, procurement, programs, monitoring and evaluation, partnership, fundraising, and communication, and how we integrate all of the, how we operationalize our policies into practice and make sure that the entire atmosphere is safe. So those are the four building blocks. You can click on and you can come back to us if you have any question or if you, are, if you would like to know how to engage. One of our commonly questions, and please allow me just to take this part because one of our guests couldn't join us today and we have some time to speak about it. I am a trainer and I would like to be engaged. I'm not an expert, but I can provide capacity building and training to safeguarding. On safeguarding, we have a pool of consultants, consultants and trainers. We always look for locals who speak the language, who understand the culture to be engaged with us. So if you think that you can provide certain services, please contact Hafsa or the email, the info email that our colleagues will, will add to the chat. And after that, we will get in touch with you. And another thing on the same area is about engaging of experts from Pakistan and South Asia uh, region, how to engage. If you think that you are an expert or a specialist on the safe garden, and you would love to be part again of our pool of consultants, or if you would like to be added to our safe garden directory list, please contact Hafsa or our uh, or the info email on the chat as well. And um, there is a question about upcomings. What we have on the pipeline now, Hafsa will be and among the Pakistan team will announce for uh, the first webinar for Pakistan it speaks with our normal start the road causes and the risks of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, we will disseminate the link through our communication channels, uh, through ICVA and through our the, the resource and support hub, in addition to uh, our newsletter that should be released in few weeks, one to two weeks from now. From policy to practice, how workable it is, we work with the organization, especially if they are engaged in the mentorship, from reviewing their code of conduct and policies. And after that, we uh, analyze the status quo, where we sit, what do we have in organizational level in terms of implementation. If not, we help to integrate the safeguarding based on the assessment, the organizational capacity assessment. We design a plan very individualized plan based in the, on, the, uh, uh, on the OCA, our organization capacity assessment, and we move with the plan. We have an interesting longer engagement, which is mentorship. It's six months program, and we deal now, we are coordinating with some networks in Pakistan to get some of their members, which is the mentorship. And it's, it is, it, it, it summarizes what do you mean by from policy to the practice? Maybe I, I think you cannot uh, actually read the chat, but yes. I just saw a great question here, um, which I don't know if maybe you want to address it now. I know Please. that we will have a, a question and answer function later. So safeguarding policy, PSCA, the question is, is this only to safeguard or protect our beneficiaries or also the staff? So on the safeguarding, Safeguarding includes everyone. We as the resource and support hub, we work with organizations with the little bit focus on the organizational structure, which means 
our staff, our contractors. In addition, this should be trickled down to anyone who interacts at any phase with the program. So safeguarding is for everyone, but we focus with the at workplace, with the organizations, trying to create safe culture inside the organization, which should be reflected to how they how how do they deal with communities to safeguard them. And if you go again to the safeguarding journey, you will find the fourth block speaking about what should I do if a problem arises if from how to complain and what to do, case management and referral and et cetera. So safeguarding is for, is, is for everyone. There are some questions that relate to uh, female uh, staff members. One that I've seen specifically addressing the fact that at times women are, uh, uh, well, exploited. I think the word that was used was exploited for wages, so earning less. So the question I think was addressing the fact, uh, the disparity and whether there can be anything done uh, as related to safeguarding, safeguarding so women. In terms, Esther and, and our colleagues, in terms of implementation or responses directly to the abusive cases, we don't implement direct. Our hub is to support organizations to know how to respond and to safeguard and how to do referral and how to be engaged with other actors where survivor or the victims are being or are being considered there in, in, in the planning process and the referral. So we don't implement direct. However, if you follow our updates, you will find plenty of resources. It speaks about the survivor-centered approach and now the trauma-informed approach in addition to how to safeguard in general. But when it comes to the implementation, resource and support hub deals with organizations, not communities directly. Great, Vajdan. There's another question that uh, has already been slightly uh, touched on before, and we think this is probably also very relevant. So uh, one of the participants mentioned that it seems there is a confusion between protection and safeguarding issues. Maybe you can speak to this. So without just lengthening the definitions, we will just add to the chat the distinction between safeguarding and protection. And again, safeguarding in an ethical commitment from the organization and putting measures in place to make sure that we safeguard all staff, partners, and anyone who interacts in any phase of the implementation of the intervention. When it comes to the protection, we know about the confusion, and that's why we, through the resource and support hub in Pakistan, we will have session around the distinctions between GBV protection and safeguarding and the intersectionality, in addition to translating some tools about the differences and definitions. And again, that brings me back, Esther, to what I started from the building blocks of the safeguarding journey. It's to start by definitions. Before I start raising awareness or addressing a problem, I need to agree on definitions and how the community, by the way, themselves and list resource CSOs uh, define um, safeguarding. I think that's very important, uh, Vachtan, and you're right to point out that it's great to start uh, at the essentials. So let me also just jump back to the essentials pack, which we, we invite you to, to browse and download. It could be quite insightful. Uh, there's something else that, that you may like to touch on. Uh, someone mentioned that the safeguarding guidelines or the standard operational procedures must be aligned uh, with the local laws. And uh, the basically the question or the request is to, to have translated versions that are that basically are in alignment with the locally enacted relevant laws in the country specific hubs. Uh, and then the question is, do we have any such information available? So when it comes to the international standards, we realize that there is a gap between international standards and the applicability to the local context because there are many factors. Some of it considered drivers and some of it considered barriers and challenges. When it comes to the contextualization, 
um, we can provide some guidelines on the implementation related to the Pakistan context specifically. So it's a contextualization process. And again, it's the time for engagement if you are thinking to contribute and engage because we contextualize it through our engagement with the National Expert Board, with the networks and partners and with those groups. So yes, the, the answer is yes, because there is always the law part. The, with the international standards, there is the law and legislations in the country context. And we always have this negotiation on how to bridge the gap to make it workable. So this is what we mean by contextualizing. So yes, it's applicable and stay tuned. And this can be applied collectively from SIA, other actors, networks, through the resource and support hub in Pakistan. Maybe if I could also just highlight something that I didn't really have time for and uh, to, to speak more about in my presentation. Uh, Hafsa did mention that we have a, a specific aggregate site where you can also access resources related specifically to what to do in emergencies. So uh, in sort of in response to the Pakistan floods, we have uh, RSH has collected a uh, some useful resources. And when you navigate to the South Asia Hub website, you will see a little pop-up in the, in the bottom corner. And when you click through that, and I will put that link into the chat right away, you will be able to access uh, these resources, which are specific as well to uh, responding in emergencies. So this could also be helpful to you. And um, just to also emphasize uh, on top of what Wachdan already mentioned, we will uh, keep on adding translated and contextualized resources. And what's already available in Urdu, some of the things that are already available in Urdu are um, basically uh, related to how to um, build up your code of conduct uh, related to the focal points, role and responsibilities. And um, within the e-learning course itself, you will find uh, quite relevant uh, resources embedded as well. So again, feel free to, to browse and uh, register and complete um, the, the first few modules and we will keep adding to that as well. Uh, Esther, on modules, those are very short, let's say modules accessible by the way. The Resource and Support Hub in Pakistan will offer orientation, orientation sessions even, and we can walk you through the implementation. If you are a network and you have a number of members who would like to take the online courses and they are hardly navigating, the Resource and Support Hub can offer orientation session and they can walk your members through the process until they get their certificates. And by the way, we one of the most, let's say, common questions is, can I, can I use those certificates in my CV? Absolutely, yes, because th those, those certificates came from the Resource and Support Hub and the on online modules were built by experts in safeguarding. So it is part of individual capacity development in addition to part of how HR can use it as an annual refresher with the staff uh, before they renew their annual contracts. So the online modules can be used in individual level, organization level, and it can be the start. Thanks so much, Weshtan. I just saw another comment, uh, which I think is very important to clarify. Uh, thank you so much. One user already started uh, the process of signing up for the newsletter, but they're pointing out that there is no option for INGOs at the time of registration to, you know, we ask what kind of organization you work for. And you are very right, there is no specific uh, designation such as INGO, but this should not prevent you from registering. So you could just put in other, uh, and uh, this, this does not discriminate you from registering for the newsletter. So, and we can also work on adding INGO uh, as, as a particular type of organization. We do have NGOs, we do have UN, we do have private sector and more, but uh, you rightly pointed out that INGO is not currently one uh, such type, but you can register by just picking other. Uh, so thank you so much for, for naming that. We have an interesting comment in the chat that says the most marginalized group in Pakistan are women with disabilities who are not supported by their own family members 
uh, rather she is called responsible for the harassment because she believes in self-sustainability despite her disability. By the way, there is certain event for disability inclusion within the activities for the resource and support hub uh, in Pakistan from September to November. And we do believe that uh, the risk or the exposure for, uh, for CA increases with disability and uh, the vulnerability during emergency. And those people are more marginalized, unfortunately, because they, are, they have less influence to their community. So please, if you would like to know how we engage this uh, disabled communities and how we do inclusion, stay tuned and follow up with us on for, for the upcomings. Also, I just wanted to point out that the questions are really amazing and it seems there's uh, already a lot of knowledge uh, related to safeguarding um, within, within this group of professionals. So it's really great to see that. Uh, what I wanted to also just mention, I have put a link to the resource library into the chat, and I'm happy to, to repeat that again. So when you're asking about specific policies, when you're asking about, um, you know, definitions, uh, you can browse the library and find a lot of these resources there. Uh, what's more, we also have animations, which highlight some of these very important distinctions. Um, we also have a, a safeguarding explained two-part animation. It's a brief animation consisting of two parts, which is also available in uh, with Urdu and Bangla captions. And this is a little uh, a little cue for you to sign up to the newsletter because we are going to also include these resources in the next newsletter, just set to go out in the next um, ten days or so. So please do sign up to the newsletter as well, and we hope to connect you and get uh, also get feedback from you. So I'll just send it back to Wajda now. Uh, there is a comment on the chat saying, don't you think where safeguarding is essential in a working places, it's also necessary to execute in the educational institutions? Of course. Our target as a resource and support hub is organizations in development and emergency settings. While safeguarding is a broad, safeguarding is a right and it's a broader concept and some educational institutions, universities, and even governments have their own safeguarding policies. So of course, it's, it's, it is, it's everyone's responsibility. We have another comment from a lawyer who runs an organization saying, I am a lawyer working for a woman supporting and woman supporting in harassment and other cases. While running an organization, the challenge is financial constraints for lawyer fee, legal costs, traveling cost and etc there must be organizational financing there must be an organization financing them of course of course and that's why we are speaking about everyone's responsibility and that refers me back to the comment that we received in the private saying we we are we are running our organizations with the with our limitations and with the minimal and actually the entire arena is donor driven so it's everyone's responsibility, yes. And there should be, as we all believe as donors and INGOs, that international standards, CHS, accountability, safeguarding standards should be implemented. And I think we all should think how to support that implementation, including financial support. But again, if financial support is not there, we need to remember, if we look back 150 years ago, Philanthropy in Pakistan was there. Islamic philanthropy was there. And they were operating in a grassroots level and they were safeguarding everyone without the presence of international organizations. I'm not saying international organizations are not responsible, but it's only about making sure that I run with the minimum and I make sure as a head of the CSO that I'm not causing harm because we are essentially present with the commitment to safeguard and having and dignify people. If the essential core is not there, then what is the value of operating with communities? Uh, Esther, maybe this is for the online team. Can we provide feedback to the online modules directly? The content? Thank you, Wajdan. So there is a, an online, um, basically an online community or an online platform. I'm happy to put the, the link into the chat as well, where we welcome uh, responses or feedback on the modules themselves. 
and you can also uh, reach out to us uh, via email. So I just pulled up on my computer the website where uh, you can put your responses. I just put that into the chat. So when you navigate to this forum, you will see that uh, there's discussions here for particular topics. There's one specifically for uh, discussing the safeguarding matters online modules. So you're welcome to go there as well. And in a moment, I'm just going to reshare the link uh, to the e-learning course itself, because I did see a comment in the chat that someone was looking for the uh, e-learning course link. And we welcome you to share the course with others so that more and more people can equip themselves with knowledge related to safeguarding. Esther, last question before we move to our guests for a few minutes to close the launch event. There is a question that speaks about how often you check our satisfaction and feedback on your services and how to provide that feedback. That's amazing. I see very interactive. <laughs> Yeah, it's great to see. Uh, so actually, we do have uh, a feedback mechanism running uh, continuously. If you're familiar with the Safeguarding Research Support Hub website, you may have seen that there are these little pop-ups uh, that appear on the website when you first um, connect to the RSH website, and they contain various questions. So sometimes we may ask you about how uh, satisfied are you with the Safeguarding Matters e-learning course? How satisfied are you with the general use of the resource library or with the search function? So we do run these, let's look at them as a questionnaire that we, that we continuously run. One thing to note here is if you do not want to receive these questions or if you do not want to see these pop-ups uh, when you log in again and again, all you need to do is you have to accept the cookies. So the cookies are, um, you know, IT measures to, to essentially uh, be compliant. And uh, basically, if you accept those cookies, then you no longer will see these uh, questions popping up. So yes, we do take um, your feedback regularly. And on top of that, there's, we also have user surveys annually. So you may receive, especially if you follow us on, on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, you will see that we put out calls to participate in our user surveys. Uh, so we hope that you can also give us feedback there. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Estelle. Let's go to our guest for the last five minutes of today. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vajtan and uh, Esther, for having a detailed session on question and answer. So uh, Fozia Vakar has joined us. And I want to welcome Fozia here. Fozia is working as an ombuds person at federal level in Pakistan. And she has wealth of experience in working in development sector and also handling gender-based violence issues. So over to you, Fozia, and thank you for joining. Thank you, Afza. And my apologies, I was supposed to join earlier, but I was a very, in a very important event, which I've left halfway in order to um, be able to participate in the RSH Pakistan Hub launch event, because I feel it's a very important um, platform uh, in which participation is a must. Um, please, uh, excuse the background. I thought it's better to speak from the car than not to speak at all. So um, I hope it's not going to distract you. Um, uh, well, today I was asked to speak about the challenges in addressing sexual exploitation and abuse in Pakistan. I'm sure much has been said already. Um, and um, again, I hope that I don't repeat a lot that has been said. But in my experience, um, there are three tiers of um, challenges in addressing sexual exploitation and abuse in Pakistan. The first is um, the very well talked about and well understood uh, challenge of um, the norms or the, the culture that we're living in, which prevents us from speaking up. It's um, speaking up against sexual exploitation and abuse. It prevents us from speaking up um, also because we don't get, we don't talk about these things. We do not um, discuss and we pretend as if there is no sexual exploitation or abuse in, in Pakistan at least. Um, that translates into us not knowing the law, also not having that awareness. And <clears throat> that permeates the mindset of the law enforcement agencies, which, and the other state agencies, which are 
um, mandated with the authority and uh, authority and and the jurisdiction uh, to address sexual exploitation and, and abuse. It's not just the law enforcement agencies. It is also um, it is also um, educational institutions. It can it can be um, you know law the uh, courts, prosecution, etc. All of that the continuum of uh, organizations that has led to a, a limited access. Um, again, to state machinery, abuse, assault, raping, primary uh, indicated in a recent survey that was done that the women, the third, 35 or so percent in uh, the house, uh, only two percent had a. So uh, that can tell you um, what kind of um, confidence we have in accessing. Uh, are uh, you know, accessing justice for that part. So that is the one um, one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is um, that uh, we may need legislation to be strengthened in certain areas. Um, but I'm glad to share that um, sexual exploitation and violence has been addressed amply and effectively through the various laws in Pakistan. I am sure it was talked about earlier, but forgive me if I'm recapping it. One of them is addressing domestic violence. It can, while we do not recognize marital rape, but within domestic violence, there is uh, an opportunity to address sexual abuse by members other than intimate partners. Definitely intimate partners if it comes to assault, but also men members other than intimate partners. Um, there is recently strengthened legislation on rape. Um, it is a um, uh, anti-rape investigation and protection, um, the protection and, Invest and investigation act of 2021, which is a strong piece of legislation, which puts some various gender sensitive mechanisms that help with, um, with uh, some of those barriers that I've just talked about um, to for women who want to access the system, be it um, the intimidation that is meted out to them by the law enforcement agencies themselves, the lack of gender sensitivity um, uh, that they experience, and simple things as um, uh, abuse, uh, aggressive um, cross, in, uh, cross investigation, or aggressive line of questioning that is put out by the lawyers of the victim, of the uh, perpetrator, or uh, the abuser to the victim um, within the courts also. So, such legislation uh, in encouraging more women uh, to access their rights. But these legislations have uh, two, there are two areas where I feel like these legis this legislation um, needs support and needs implementation. One is awareness of the law. And I know that uh, the law um, talks about Sorry. And uh, I know that the law, law talks about uh, mechanisms, concrete mechanisms, as well as widespread awareness. So uh, that is happening. Um, and finally, I feel that uh, uh, the mechanisms given the institutions in, outlined within these laws need to be strengthened. Finally, I think, um, and I know that you have to close, I just want to congratulate the launch of this hub because I feel it. Um, is very important in addressing harassment against women, exploitation and abuse of women, uh, because it st all starts from knowing your rights and then understanding what the mechanisms for redress is. Thank you, Azza, for reaching out and thank you to the RSH Pakistan and wish you all the best. Thank you, Kozia. Thank you so very much. I'm sorry at the end, we, um, we are actually closing down because the link will be uh, ended soon. So thank you so much for having you here and we will definitely going to partner with you as well in future and we're looking forward that how the resource and support hub can build partnership with, uh, with Ombudsperson office and looking forward and address the challenges. Okay, thank you so very much everyone for giving your time and looking forward to support you as much as we can do from the resource and support hub and looking forward to get in touch in future as well. Take good care of you and have a great evening.